Dean, so welcome everybody to Church Motion Park. Great to Thank see you. you. Great to see you. I imagine more people will come in a minute. So let's just stretch a little bit. Oh, I like yes. that. I like that little ritual of stretching. Kim started with Kim is away today. So let's sing this little light of mine. Well, let me make sure. Okay. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That light is the light of love, and I'm gonna let it shine. Light is the light of love, I'm gonna let it shine. Light is the light of love, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Shine all over everybody here, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all over everybody here, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine all No, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Shine it under a bushel. No, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Monday he gave me the book of love. Tuesday peace came from above. Wednesday she taught me to have more faith. Thursday she gave me a little more grace Friday told me to watch and pray Saturday told me what to say Sunday gave me the power to find Just to let my little light shine Woo! This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine This little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine everybody welcome and now we're going to hear from Gloria Liggett all the way from Santa Barbara welcome Gloria and unmute yes. there she goes all the way from Santa Barbara and the beautiful sunny every day for the we have sun today so I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement Church and Ocean Park is located on indigenous land. We pay respect to the Tonga people, their history, for things they hold in their memories, their traditions and culture, the culture of this. We appreciate those who are alive today as well as generations to come. As we continue to steward this land, all love, we remember them always. And now in the, in the tradition, I, I'm Tonga, and in the tradition, when, when we um, gather together, we form a circle, and in the center of the circle, we light sage, usually an elder, or now, all of a sudden, in our, uh, up here in the Chumash land where I live, the children are taking over. 
we have a wonderful group of young people and they've decided they want to do all the blessings. Every time we do a ceremony, they step up and say, we're going to do that today. And we go, oh, okay. So that's a gift to us. But in the tradition, um, we are in our circle. And as each, each direction is called, we face in that direction, which of course we can't do virtually, but in, So I'm going to call in the four directions. The first direction is the east, which brings us the element of fire. We face towards the direction of the rising sun, the direction of the child and beginnings for us all. We give thanks for children, for spirits yet to come. Every day we start anew. The east stands for wisdom, and helps us to understand and care for all others. The South brings the element of fire of the warmth of, of a mother's heart. We acknowledge women and pray for their protection through their years. The warmth of the South offers us, us heal, uh, offers us healing and wisdom and clarity and offers It is the direction of the setting sun of sundown. We remember those who have passed. We remember the ancestors and give thanks for all the old ways. The West represents adulthood and brings balance to our lives, to nurturing our own self-worth. The North brings the element of air. It's the direction of winter winds which bring cleansing, peace in our lives. We honor all men then and their place of fertility to make wise choices and all that comes before them. We honor our father's sky, always above us who lifts our hearts. We lift our hearts now to our creator. We honor mother earth and the gifts she has given and call for all her, care for all her creatures with love and respect. And then we look within us. We fill our hearts with love and thankfulness for all we have and all we will share with others always. May our days be blessed and filled with loving kindness. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you for blessing us with that time of prayerful time of, uh centering and meaning. Uh, I'm Janet McKithen. I'm also welcome you to this space. We're an interfaith congregation, so you're welcome if you're Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Wiccan, uh, anything else that I haven't mentioned. And, and that doesn't mean that we're Christian. We're a Christian community, but we'll accept anybody else. What it means is we're actually interfaith, that we are composed of these different faith traditions and different people on different spiritual journeys. So that means that no matter who you are or what spiritual path you're on, nobody else is going to be trying to convince you to be whatever it is that they are, because each one of us have something to contribute to the whole and to the space of what actually is reality. Each of us have a part of a, a certain perspective, but together we can continually widen and enlarge our perspective of reality so that we can uh, be better peacemakers in the world and be, be better uh, bringers about of um, equity and justice. So welcome to the Church in Ocean Park. We're very glad to, you're here. And I'm very excited today because we're in the midst of a Hindu festival and people may not even know that. And so uh, Tahil, my friend, is going to be um, sharing with us this morning. But first, we're going to have a, a Thich Nhat Hanh chant and also a reading. Yeah, we like to center ourselves at the beginning of the service. A lot of thoughts are going around in your head, emotions, feelings, ruminations. So we say, I have arrived, I am home in the here and the now three times. 
I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. I have arrived. I am home in the here and in the now. Now a reading for Indigenous Peoples Day. It is called Peace Path by Hyde E. Erdrich. This path their people walked 100, 200 endless years since the tall grass opened for us and we breathe the incense that sun on prairie offers to sky. Peace offering with each breath, each footstep out of woods to grasslands plotted with history, removal, remediation, restoration. Orchid green glow within, white froth calling a moth who nightly seeks the now rare scent invisible to us. Invisible history of this place where a great grandfather, a boy, besides two priests and 900 warriors, gazed intent into an 1870 photo, his garments white as orchids. Peace flag, white banner with red cross, crowned with thorns, held by a boy at the elbow of a priest, beside Ojibwe warriors, beside Dakota warriors. Peace offered after smoke and dance and Ojibwe gifts of elaborate beaded garments thrown back and refusable and refusal by Dakota warriors torn with grief their brother, since their brother's murder. This is the path our people ran through white flags of prairie plants unbroken treaty, peace offering with each breath, each footstep out of woods to grasslands plotted with history, removal, remediation, restoration. Two Dakota held up as great men, humbled themselves to an offer of peace before a long walk south, before our people entered the trail walking west and north, where you walk now, where we seek the source, the now rare scent, invisible as history, history the tall grass opens for us. Breathe the incense of sun on prairie, offer peace to the sky. I'm gonna sing a song now that names many goddesses, Hindu goddesses. Uh, then the second part of it is uh, Greek and Roman goddesses. Uh, I believe Tahil today is talking about the Divine Feminine. So I'm going to put the lyrics in the chat. You could follow along. Also, I looked up all these names today on the Internet, and I, if you want a copy of this, just let me...
Joe Sharma is an activist based in Los Angeles. He was born to a Hindu father and a Sikh mother. 2012, he became involved in efforts for interfaith literacy and social justice and has been active there for the regional coordinator for North America at United Religions. And he's one of three interfaith ministers in residence for the Episcopal Diocese of Los Angeles. He serves on various organizations in different uh, communities and in different ways that promote interfaith cooperation and ethical pluralism, including, and productive norms in society, including Interfaith Youth Corps, the Parliament of World Religions, the Gieberts Center, and the Interreligious Council of Southern California. Sahil previously worked as the Faith Outreach Manager for Brave New Films, a social justice documentary organization based in Los Angeles, that empowers communities and teaches civic participation through new media, facilitation, and strategies for action. He is also a contributing author to books, including Co-Human Harmony, Using Our Shared Humanity to Build Bridges, to Bridge Divides, I mean, Hindu Approaches to Spiritual Care, Chaplaincy in the Stories of Courage, Activism, and Hope Across Religions. And Tahil is a very active part in the Church in Ocean Park community. He's been with us many, many times, and we're glad he's back. Welcome back, Tahil Sharma. <laughs> Thank you. As, just as expected, my internet just had to go out right at the minute you announced me. Um, I am so oh. sorry. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, creating this uh, space uh, for me to be able to speak today. As others have reflected, I also speak on the land of the Tongva people and offer my great gratitude and obeisance to them for the stewardship that they brought to this land and in the ways that we continue to uplift them and to be able to uh, fight for their justice. Um, and to wish everyone a Shubh Navratri. Um, this is a very um, unique celebration among the world's religions in that it centers and celebrates the feminine divine, uh, which is not a unique experience to Hinduism itself, um, but it is indeed a diversified and a beautiful way of understanding the balance of creation. Um, so to open up the space today, I will be chanting what is known as the Durga Saptashloki. Um, which are the seven verses of an important text known as the Devi Mahatmyam. Um, these texts basically um, helped, help us to understand from the voices of the gods themselves as they authored these texts uh, to be able to understand the importance um, of the goddess. Um, so I'll read the, um, um, I will read each verse and I'll read the translation after that uh, so that you all can understand what's being said before I go into my remarks. Oh, Asya Shri Durga Sapta Shloki Stotra Maha Mantrasya Narayana Rishi Anushtupa Chandamsi Shri Maha Kali Maha Lakshmi Maha Saraswatyo Devata Shri Jagadamba Pri Tyarthe Sapta Shati Pathangatve Japevini Yogaha so this is the Durga Saptashloki, which is composed by Sri Narayan. It is pronounced in the Anushtup meter, and it's dedicated to the goddesses Mahakali, Mahalakshmi, and Mahasaraswati. This mantra is meant to recite and be and to please the mother of the universe. Yani nama pichetansi devi bhagavati hisa balada krishya mohaya mahamaya prayachati. Even the consciousness of the spiritually involved souls are part of you, O oh goddess, for you make them when you take the form of Mahamaya, which is the one who presents herself as the form of illusion. Daridra dukha bayahari nikatvatanya sarvopakara karanaya sadarta chitta. O Devi Durga, whoever remembers you with devotion, you remove their endless fears and the, of reincarnation from the mind of that person. Whoever meditates on you in their heart, 
you bestow exceeding auspiciousness, which is beyond description. O oh, mother, apart from you, who else can destroy poverty, sorrow, and fear from our lives, which appears in a never-ending cycle? Your heart is always full of compassion for rendering all sorts of help to your devotees. Salutations to you, O Mother of the Universe, the auspicious of all the auspicious, uh, who fulfills the auspiciousness and the objectives of her devotees. O giver of refuge with three eyes, representing the past, present, and future, and containing within them the sun, moon, and the fire. O Gauri, the shining one, salutations to you, O wife of Narayan. You are the intent upon pursuing the distressed and the oppressed who take your refuge wholeheartedly and remove all of their suffering. Salutations to you, O wife of Narayan. Sarva Surupi Sarveshi Sarva Shakti Samanvite Hino Devi Durge Devi Namostute. You exist in all forms of all gods and goddesses and manifestations. O oh goddess, please protect us from these fears. Saluta salutations to you, O Durga Devi. Rogana Shesha Napahan Situshta, Tushta Dukaman Sakalana Bhishta, Twamashita Nam Navipandara Nam, Twamashita Yam Shayatam Prayanti. When you are pleased with our devotion, you destroy the very root of our worldly diseases. But if you are displeased with us, you will destroy all our aspirations and wishes. By your refuge, men cannot go astray and no misfortunes can finally overcome them. Your refuge indeed is my final refuge when I depart from this world. O goddess of all the three worlds, the heavens, the netherworld, and the universe, when you are pleased, you mitigate all our distresses. Thus, in this manner, your grace works to destroy our inner enemies. May there be peace within us, between us, and all around us. So today, we talk about the story of Navratri, the story of the Nine Nights, which is an important festival for many millions of Hindus around the world but particularly celebrated by those who honor the feminine divine within Hinduism. The story goes that there was a demon by the name of Mahishasur, or the bullheaded demon, who had the opportunity to be able to transform himself into whatever other creature he wanted. And in his, um, mind you, this is mythology, so it may not make entire sense, but please bear with me as you understand the creativeness of the story. Um, he was a king um, for um, a land in South Asia that allowed him to be able to look over uh, what was going on. And he was a demon. Live forever. Um, and he prayed to the god Brahma and said, give me this boon that I can live eternally, that I become immortal. And the god Brahma said, oh, Mahishasur, remember that nothing in this world is eternal or immortal, that we all are a part of the cycle of birth, death, and rebirth. And I cannot give you this blessing. So he tries to get a little creative and says, okay, if this is the case, then make sure that the only way that I die is by energy, that nothing, nothing can touch me other than energy itself. And it was a confusing request, but it was one nonetheless, because living in the material world meant anything that touched him that was material could not kill him. And with this arrogance of being able to say that he's achieved a form of immortality, he begins to take over the universe and the heavens. Uh, the gods try to get into um, battles with him, and they all seem to lose. And the gods and others don't know what to do. So many of the manifestations of the divine come together and begin to have this conversation. How do we address this problem? There is a demon that wants to take over the entire universe and we cannot seem to um, 
destroy his intentions or his self. So what do we do about that? So they all decide to actually put their energy together. And this beam of light shines from the center of all of this energy and actually forms the goddess Durga. This story of the goddess Durga is why she is so important among millions of devotees because for many people that don't understand Hinduism, um, many people merely see it as a very complicated way of saying we are polytheists. But in actuality, there's a very complicated relationship with the divine that comes out of Hinduism in that not everyone looks at the divine the same way but we accept those various forms of understanding the divine as Hinduism. So some people may see Hinduism monotheistically. Some may see Hinduism polytheistically. Then some people may see it as an amalgamation of the two, where that the millions of gods and goddesses actually are the um, forms and manifestations of a singular primordial energy. And this is one of the examples where many of those different contexts come together because goddess Durga is supposed to be Shakti. She is the essence of energy. For anything physical that exists in the universe, she is the energy that runs the show behind the scenes. And this actually speaks to the deeper theology of Hinduism that talks about the balance of the masculine and the feminine. With creation itself, you need the energy to create it. So both of those things must coincide together to manifest. For any form of creation, you need knowledge. For any form of sustenance, you need wealth. For any form of destruction, you need power. For every physical manifestation that may be masculine, there is a feminine complement to that work. So the goddess Durga was formed as the primordial energy manifest. And she was able to slay the demon Mahishasur because he thought she was just a woman. What she didn't understand is that she is the energy that runs the entire universe. Without her energy, there's no point in existence. And there's a deeper message to that that comes out of, that comes out of Hinduism that unfortunately many people still do not understand. Many of what we consider the feminine things within Hinduism are very important to how we are able to survive and understand reality in itself. Um, all of the, all of the um, important aspects of how we understand energy are feminine. Food is feminine. Anger and destruction is feminine. Time is feminine. The earth is feminine. And a lot of people actually don't understand that Hinduism displays those things, unfortunately, because of the nature of patriarchy and toxic masculinity that controls the norm of how people generally understand Hinduism. You see it through the lens of Ram and Krishna who are the most typically understood uh, gods from Hinduism. You understand Hinduism from the Bhagavad Gita and you understand Hinduism from yoga and different sensory practices. And the reality is the nature of, of an organized chaos. Who are you there? We need to find out the an end of this of the feminine divine. Theo, can you hear me? Okay, so now we can guess. Who wants to finish the story? We, no, we could have some really good stories from here. With, the, with you all, I'm sure there could be like, you don't want to hear mine. I mean, that would be ridiculous. So come on, who's going to tell their story till he gets back? So what have you liked so far? I can tell you what I like. But, but what do you guys like so far? I like the fact that he's talking about um, a lot of things, but the, the, patriarch, the patriarchal um, portrayal of Hinduism is the same thing as in so many different religions. And so, so much of the way we know the world is seen through patriarchy eyes. And so we can't assume that what we've heard and learned about Hinduism is correct and the whole story because it's seen through the lens that we see everything through, which is patriarchy and racism and colonialism and all of that. Uh, Craig, you unmuted. Uh, hear him speak, I am reminded specifically about the relationship 
that the Egyptians felt with Ma'at, justice. And that was indeed feminine energy. As well, when we look at, you know, you made a land acknowledgement with, you know, um, a Native American group and the Iroquois, you know, before the law got really, I guess you could say ensconced, the women had to sit. And it was the elder women that more or less brought in specifically what was wrong, if anything, with the tribe, you know, and their wisdom more or less proved much insightful. It is said that much of what we see in terms of justice in the early Americas is based on, you know, what the Iroquois women had to do in regards to uh, uh, passing judgment and, 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 and being fruitful within that. So that's, you know, that's what that reminds me of. When, when 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 I listened to him, I had a question for him. Um, well, we'll get to the questions in a minute. He's back, so we're hoping he can finish up now. Welcome back, Tahil. We know this kind of thing happens. <laughs> Thank you so much, Reverend Janet. Sorry, everyone. Um, so, in in the story of understanding the the feminine divine, uh, today being the fourth uh, night of uh, this celebration known as Navratri. Uh, we celebrate the reality of what the story of the goddess Durga was about, which was understanding that she was the mother of the universe. Um, giving her the ability to um, understand that in her story as becoming this primordial energy that represents everything that fuels the way that we function in this reality means that we have a very deep responsibility in understanding the relationship that we have to the feminine divine within ourselves that is inseparable from us and that makes us complete. And that actually means for me as a Hindu that I have to go much deeper into my understanding and upbringing in Hinduism and to actually deconstruct it for all of the um, terrible oppressive things that it's taught me as well. I am what you would call a anti-caste Hindu. Um, someone who comes from the Hindu tradition is oftentimes brought up in the reality of a caste system that is nothing but repressive. And as someone who has seen a family teaching the norms that we are a religion of greatness, we are religions of traditions that span thousands of years, also made me realize that me stepping into the feminine divine gave me a divine rage to push back against oppression. And that meant that I had to turn in and actually say, how can you say we are good Hindus if we have a system that promotes oppression? And of course, asking that question is often not easy and it's also very dangerous. But it meant that I actually have a responsibility to see through the transformation of Hinduism and how it hopefully will be, begin to enter a cycle of regeneration and restoration from this kind of oppression. And the feminine divine has helped me to understand that in a way that other traditions in Hinduism did not help me to understand. And it was because the nature of patriarchy and toxic masculinity still runs the show for many Hindu communities. Where the male is the center, that is where the problem starts, unfortunately. Because we have stories within Hinduism that actually teach us about the egalitarian nature of how everything has to exist. You cannot have one without the other. And that can mean so many different things in a, in a space where uh, patriarchy rules. So I lean in as a feminine, you know, uh, in within the femininity that exists within me and the feminine divine that exists in all things to say, I have to be a better Hindu by showing up for those who are experiencing injustice. And that's looked like a lot of different things in the past nine years. Um, I find myself, you know, really in a space of um, deep thought and reflection about this all the time because 
being someone that's dedicated to this work means trying to figure out where we find solace, where we find healing, where we find the audacity necessary to do what's right. And I found all of that in the feminine divine because I began to have a better understanding of the relationship with myself and the relationship that I have to the world. And it was the mother goddess that taught me how important and inseparable we are from one another. And that is the kind of message that I bring you all today. That you first think about the feminine divine that's within you, that makes you an inseparable part of everyone on this call and everything that exists without you, around you. But secondly, to think about how the feminine divine inspires you to be able to do what's right, both courageously and audaciously. Because many times we do not look at our feminine qualities to be able to look for strength. And we need to do a better job. Passive terms. They are very active terms that we need to act on. But third, how do we learn to make sure that the feminine divine does not just exist as a character trait to Hinduism, but exists as an inseparable part of how every Hindu and every person of faith is to understand their relationship to the divine. If you focus on a, di a divinity that is merely masculine, you only have half the story. And I invite you all to explore that further story together, that the divine is both masculine and feminine in very beautiful ways. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a wonderful message. Okay, now I would like to sing a song. And you please join me at home. This is a song by Star, uh, Starhawk. And Starhawk is an American-born author, activist, permaculture designer, and teacher, and a prominent voice in modern Earth-based spirituality. Is that what it says? Wait. Um, yeah, Earth-based spirituality and ecofeminism. So this is called the Way to the Well. I put it in the I put it in the chat. We will never, never lose our way to the well of her memory and the power of her living flame. It will rise, it will rise again. We will never, never lose our way. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Tahil. 
uh, I have so many comments myself and I, we were just ending with Craig. We went on to Craig to speak while you were uh, unintentionally. So I'm going to go back to Craig to start us off with our questions. And I appreciate what you said, Craig, uh, before your question. So just go ahead and ask him your question. That would be great. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to comment first because it would lead into the question. But so much of what you say, I can see a commercialization of, you know, what it is you had spoke about in the sense that women have become warriors. And what gets lost in that is the whole idea of why it is necessary for them to expend the kind of energy that is to quell that evil. My question becomes when you speak about how the gods more or less came together to recognize that this all powerful thing, what was that, you know, what was that essence? Stand that this is something, you know, um, that we need to unify on because I think that seems to be missing, you know, in 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 relationship to what we are going through now. So I'm 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 hoping you can expound specifically on what that that life force is that binded all that energy to where we can overcome that 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 viciousness that's out there. That's a great question. Um... So a couple of things come to mind in answering that question. Um, the first is that um, it was men among men trying to fix a problem with violence. And in the ways that mythology works in Hinduism, uh, that can look like a lot of different things and there are a lot of different battles that happen. Um, but the specificity of the boon that the demon Mahish By energy and that implied that he was looking to get destroyed by something that he could not think would be possible so the first thing that the gods did wrong was to try to act in their arrogance and in their strength to be able to uh, fight a demon and that proved to be one of the worst mistakes they could make because that only emboldened him and made him more powerful what they forgot to do was understand what the boon was and what they needed to do about it. And what they kept forgetting by doing so was to tap into the energy that they all possess already that made them the, the, the deities that they are in the heavens. So when they all began to enter this discussion, they said, what are we doing wrong? And essentially, the Lord Shiva said, well, you're not actually understanding the essence of how you. And the particular point that makes this story so salient is the fact that the demon was very, in very many ways, a misogynist. He did not see any power within women because they were women. And the nature of the story is to understand that this was not just about trying to you know, promote victory and triumph over evil, but to promote the necessity of understanding that goes with understanding the feminine divine and the role that it plays in all of creation. So when all the energy was brought together by the different gods, this light that shone, shone through the entire universe that people could not comprehend was that essence and energy of the feminine divine, which is all energy. And in, in this awe and confusion, the gods began to ask this energy, what are you? And she responds, I am your The energy that requires you to become physically manifest. And it's that energy that then transformed itself into the goddess Durga, who represents herself as this woman with flowing long hair, with 10 arms carrying various weapons and trinkets, uh, with a steed as a lion, to be able to show the strength of that energy in a unique way. When the god Mahishasur saw her, she, he was blown away and wanted to marry her instead. 
and treat him as a bride. And she said, you can't do that because that's not how I function. <laughs> he didn't like that and said that if I'm not going to make you my wife, I'm going to make you my slave. And she said, you can bloody well try. And in the process of trying to make his point about how strong and immortal he was, he, she was able to beat him to the ground and before killing him, that is about to kill me. And she released her manifest form and showed herself as the energy that ran the universe. And with that, she was able to slay him. Because he then began to understand before his last minutes of breath that I messed with the energy that actually helps me to exist too. Mm -hmm. And it is so important to be able to delve into the importance of why a story like that might be important in various different ways and how in some ways that story can also be problematic because it does show a form of violence. It does show you know, the nature of you know, where violence is inseparable from reality, unfortunately. And how we respond at times say that if there is an inevitability of violence, our responsibility is to mitigate it, but never to be the ones that offer it as oppressors or to be the ones that are on the offensive end. Feminine divinity, that we show up as the defenders of those who are downtrodden and oppressed. So I hope that answers bits and pieces of your question, because I can certainly say that I am a practitioner, but I am not a theologian. My words are very... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so, you know, I think that was very comprehensive. That was uh, wonderful. I appreciate it a lot. Is are, Anybody else have a question? I think while I'm waiting for hands to raise, I want to say something about how the many gods and the one God or what different people see it as uh, uh, many and some people say it as all parts of one. It, it just reminds me of the Trinity. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not unusual for religions to have multiple facets of the divinity and for people to relate to different ones. I know people who relate strongly to the Holy Spirit, you know, and so, and others are like to the creator God. So I think that, um, yeah, Hinduism is not alone in that. Uh, Joanne? Uh, yes, I, I, I was so uh, interested in, in your description of this uh, goddess and, and the feminine, uh, the power, uh, the energy of the universe. I, I mean, it seems to uh, connect so strongly to the ability, the ability of the feminine to give birth, uh, the, the ability to, pr to produce life, new life. Um, mm. But I am also interested in the anger. You said something. You said another word with the anger, which I've forgotten. That she represents mm -hmm. anger and something else. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Joanne, one thing that you that you need to know about the aspect of the mother. the day of Kushmanda, which sees the goddess Durga in the form of the one who gives birth to the universe through her golden womb, where she was able to realize what she actually is in this form of being, you know, the manifest goddess. Um, today is the day where she realized that, oh, I am the mother of the universe. I am the energy that's being manifested in the form of this goddess. And, um, to your point about anger, um, this same goddess Durga has the propensity to be angry when her, um, when her creation is in pain. And what happens is um, the story of what happened to the goddess Durga when her anger became uncontrollable. She being a goddess of 10 arms with, you know, um, uh, of a face that is, is charming and calm while being able to even approach combat in that same way, when her creation was being threatened. And she then took the form of goddess Kali, which turned her long hair into even longer hair, which turned her skin black, 
which made her think about the energy of chaos that that same energy was already within her as this primordial energy. And that she began to destroy different worlds, that she began to take everything into her own hands and make it a part of her again. That energy of Kali makes her this, um, uh, this essence of time, this essence of ego, this essence of chaos that is important to understand in the process of impermanence. Um, when you are cycling in and out of birth, death, and rebirth, that she is very much a part of that cycle. And the form of Kali is the, the death and the destruction that happens within the, rea the realism of this um, uh, circumstance that we're in. Um, and we don't see it as something uh, terrible or scary. We see it as a part of a process because it is a part of what makes us in the Hindu tradition very much understand why things happen cyclically rather than in a lineal, a linear way. Linda, you had a question. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I really don't. Know. I mean, this is this is something I know almost like very embarrassingly little about. I just have to say that I really, um, yeah, I have a, a lot of sort of um, beginner rookie questions. Um, so, um, so I'm just trying to figure. I mean, I sort of see a the, theology as sort of a self-contained system um, in which, right everything right and um so i'm trying to figure this out uh i'm trying to understand this so let me ask this is is in in this theological from this the, in this theological perspective um and how it relates to human nature um is this a perspective that says that certain emotions and or personality traits are essentially masculine and others are essentially feminine mm. and mm. if so is this then a theological system that is based on a gender binary mm. 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 That, that is actually a very good question. Um, so the, the Navaras, which is what you're talking about from the Hindu perspective, um, those expressions of all those different emotions are all feminine. So if it is joy, if it is anger, if it is strength, if it is sadness, if it is ecstasy, all of those emotions are all feminine within Hinduism. And it's a fascinating thing that you talk about um, the gender binary in particular because Hinduism in its larger history, um, both in mythology and in practice, have an existence of a variance of LGBTQ identities. So there are there is a presence of people that are gender fluid. There is a presence of people who are homosexual and transgender. Part of the Hindu community. But to your point, the problem actually that exists is a problem that started developing um, following the caste system and over time as um, colonization began to play its role within um, the region as well. Because when you have systems where people are supposed to be guaranteed certain rights, you begin to see that there is also a system of being able to control power. So what was supposed to be a horizontal system then became a hierarchical vertical system where certain people were the haves and certain people were the have nots. And whoever the haves were got to choose who the have nots were. And in that process, women were left out, the LGBTQ community was left out, certain castes were left out, interpretations made it so that you could never leave your caste. And over time, it just got kept getting worse. And colonization played its role by saying, 
oh, not only do you have this masculine aspect, but you also have a socioeconomic aspect to this. So capitalism plays its role in letting you know who are the haves and who are the have nots and how you can fulfill certain needs without actually needing to do much about it. Um, by actually restoring the sanity and the sacredness of every individual in society. Um, so to your point, um, the, the, the binary is playing a bigger role now than it probably did before in that, you know, what we are considering masculine is a hand-me-down of a lot of, you know, the Western understandings of masculinity while then being complemented by, oh, let's take it a notch further and associate it with the caste system. So the highest men among the caste are the most important while, the low, uh, while who those are considered the lowest especially women will be treated the worst. Thank you, thank you so much. So that was a great question and a great answer. Um, do we have any further questions? This has been very enlightening, Tahil, and uh, we could go on for a long time. I think that this opens up a lot of new perspectives for a lot of us and uh, new ways of, of thinking about things. Joseph, do you have a question? Not really. Um, I've been reading, I'm doing a thesis on um, my dissertation on humor. And I've been reading about um, humor in Hinduism. And it seems as though many of the, many of the myths and the stories, uh, there is a lot of humor in, the, in it. And the humor is what um, tries to explain our our present and all of that. So that's what I've been looking at, really. Wow, that's and, um, a, that is. I would love to read that. <laughs> yeah, because that's actually a very um, largely unspoken point that I don't think I've ever talked about in Hindu mythology, and it's that there is actually a lot of banter and like light dialogue between mm. people within mythology, even, even especially between uh, the story that I talk about uh, between Durga and Mahishasur, they actually have a banter before they get into battle with each other mm -hmm. where yeah. the goddess is basically making fun of the demon saying, you're not, you're not, not only are you not my type, like um, you can't afford me is basically the joke that she's trying to get mm -hmm. across. Um, and that kind of banter is actually very common in Hindu mythology mm -hmm. because it's the nature of communication before it's right. an exertion towards violence. Right. That's appreciate all the sharing and um, we'll go on to a song now. Thank you so much. the song comes from it, but I know it. My crescent-shaped part of 